Pop the trunk. Welcome Come back on. to the Context Welcome. Coaching Podcast. We are joined today by my friend, mentor, Germano Denise, who is the math department chair at Stevenson School and one of our current football coaches, used to be the head football coach, basketball coach, baseball coach, jack of all trades. Welcome to the show. Thank you, Justin, for having me. It's a pleasure to be on the Contacts Podcast. Let's get this. So you have a unique situation. So uh, before I dive into what I want to know, I want you to give the audience a little background about uh, how you got into coaching. Take us through your background. Um, you know, how did you land your first job and any any subsequent jobs and uh, end up where you are now? Well, it started back in 1994, actually. I ran into a good friend of mine who was uh, my youth baseball coach. And at the particular point in time, he was looking for an assistant coach at Bishop Odell High School. I actually got my teeth, I cut my teeth uh, coaching baseball. So I coached at Bishop Odell High, Bishop Odell High School for two years as a varsity assistant coach. And it was during that time that I actually began coaching football. Uh, I think in the fall of 95, I actually worked with coach Paul, Paul Perinon, who gave me an opportunity to coach football. And I was just in a substitute teacher, uh, football coach, baseball coach, bounced around and had the opportunity to move to Sacramento. And I, I really got going in the coaching ranks spent five years at Jesuit high school working in their football and baseball programs. And in 2001, I was able to come to Stevenson. I worked as the head JV baseball and football coach in 2001, 2002 and 2003 was my very first season as the varsity football coach. And during my time here at Stevenson, I've worked in the varsity football program, the varsity basketball program and the varsity baseball program. So I've been fortunate enough to work with a lot of good people. And my buddy Ray Allen was the one who actually gave me the start. Love it. Perfect background information for where I want to go with this. So to help ground the audience in regards to what you just shared, you became the head football coach in 2003. Before that, you had been an assistant in a variety of sports. What did you realize in that moment, as much coaching and mentorship that as you had been given, as you had earned throughout your time as an assistant, uh, that you needed to figure out, that kind of caught you out of left field where it was like, what did I get myself into? What are some of the things that presented challenges that you would offer to others as, hey, when, when you move over 18 inches, you need to be ready for this? The first thing that I learned when I became a head coach uh, at any level was coaching your coaches is equally as important as coaching your kids. So they're, they're an extension of you. And there are moments in time to where I just didn't soak up enough information from my mentors in terms of what it was like uh, to coach assistant coaches. And there were some growing pains early on in terms of I, I knew the I knew the X's and O's. I knew what to do. But there are moments in time to where my coaches needed to be coached and I just hadn't gotten enough experience of working with, you know, older people. And can you dive into some specifics of how you would manage that differently if put back in that seat today? Oh, in that particular case, I think you you need to have a foundation and a groundwork and, and really team goals and guidelines that start with you and your coaching staff. I think many of us develop uh, these wonderful things. I know I spent a, a good deal of time reading about John Wooden and you know utilizing things like the pyramid of success. And so we all have these sayings and these things that we put up in the locker rooms, in our classrooms, but those are all related to our relationships with the head coach and as, let's say your team captains or your team but really taking the time to have a retreat, get together with your coaches and spend more than that 15 minutes post or pre-practice in the parking lot, you know, debriefing on what is going on. Really kind of get to the nuts and bolts of what makes them tick as individuals and, and how they can use their knowledge 
and wisdom to to share not amongst not only amongst the coaches but with the kids as well. So with that, as you actually stepped away from air quote coaching for a little while when you became the math department chair, um, obviously still involved with youth sports with your children and other things, and 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 also you know as an observing coach giving wisdom to the rest of us while you were uh, retired. Um, what was it like stepping back into sports and not necessarily being in the head head coach role and having to fill a role uh, that was 18 inches back to the other way? What did you learn doing that? What are things that uh, you were able to take away from that experience that served you in your most recent iteration of being the lead coach um, this year? I really leaned on the head coach in terms of finding out what the little, the, the nitty gritty things and the, the things that needed to be done that, you know, you could take off the head coach's plate. So simple things like getting meals ready, figuring out how to handle and manage the uniforms, just being someone who is, you know, can accept a role lesser than what the head coach needs to, to do in that sense is, you know, we think about this from a delegation standpoint in terms of when you're the head coach and you can delegate responsibilities. I became a responsible receiver of delegation. So I think that's the best thing that I can say is if cones needed to be picked up, if you needed to do the dirty work, I appreciated it a lot more coming back into it to where I wasn't the one that had to pick the footballs up. I gladly take that on because I know just how much work the head coach has to do or We'll get some kids to I'll be able to offset that or, you know, lead by example and help our kids do some of the things that, you know, the other people don't necessarily want to do and you know, help the head coach out. So knowing that. And you've touched on this a little bit, but I want to dive in a little bit deeper in regards to. Someone that is in your circle of trust gets put in a position where they are now the head coach of a program. Besides developing your coaches, because they might not be in a position to do that, right? They might be green at the same time and need to figure out that skill set. What would be the three things or a small list that's like, hey, one, two, three, if you don't do these, you're going to be drowning the entire year. Yeah, I think you have to identify what you're good at and then – if you find, and then you also have to figure out what you're not good at. So I know my wife was talking to me about some training that they did at her job in terms of finding out what your superpowers are. So once you identify what your superpowers are, run with it. But if you identify weaknesses and you have people who can, you know, whose superpowers are actually your weaknesses, give those things up. So if you are not extremely organized, but you work with someone who is organized and wants to do things, fully embrace it. So making out call sheets, taking role, doing other things, those are things that other people will gladly do if they're good at it. And then they'll let they'll allow you to do the things that you are good at. So, you know, an example of some things we've talked about is ordering uniforms or delegating responsibility. If you are in a situation where, you know, oftentimes as a head coach, you don't get to coach as much because you're responsible you're responsible for so many other things. If you have an experienced coach on your staff who can handle those things and the ego is not, you know, driven by who gets the credit, then you can really get some stuff done. So that's number one. You asked me that. I want to make sure I, I answer the prompts. So number two is setting boundaries for yourself uh, with respect to your own work time, your own workflow and your family time. I know there are points in time during my career early on to where I just needed to get something done. I just need to finish this up. And the next thing you know, you know, two to three hours have passed. So really managing your time well and understanding that. And then also don't get fired at home. Don't get fired at home for sure. And then I think you have to really pick the battles with your kids that you feel are important. So you and I have talked about um philosophies about how you wear your stuff or what you wear or what you do i think you come to a common ground to where 
there's nothing that when you come to practice, there's something that a kid is wearing or doing that's driving you nuts that you either squash the behavior or you accept it. You don't live in that gray area of trying to tell a kid that they need to untuck their jersey or they need to do something else all the time. I think those are the things that small things like that can really drive you bonkers. And you just, you you know, you pick your battles. And I think if it's important to winning, then I think you need to stress it. But if, you know, it's important to students and players feeling like they have some agency and it's something you discuss, I'm all for it. So let me ask you this question, which is more based on me knowing you personally and something you shared about delegation and, and learning how to do that. As somebody that has described themselves as a football coach who generally they tend to be micromanagers, uh, how do you get yourself to that place where you can let go? What are the things that finally became aha moments where it's just like uh, diminishing marginal utility to uh, quote our economics class uh, in regards to uh, realizing it's better to let go than to try to do everything. How do you, what was the trigger moment for you or the aha moment? And, and how do you offer that up to people that still aren't quite there? I think the best thing that you can, you know, work with and understand is just because you're the head coach doesn't mean you know everything and it doesn't mean you know it the best. So there can be other people on your staff who are really good at, you know, breaking down plays from a defensive perspective that can help you out. There are people who spend a lot of time with resources like YouTube, uh, books, clinics that are really good at the things that they do. And oftentimes, because you are the head coach, you are the micromanager, you feel like the buck stops with you. And so you have to approve it. And then at a certain point, there are people who will come up to you and show something to you and go, oh, wow, I never thought about that. I have faith in you. You've shown me that you can do this. I need to give this to you. And then I think that's one of those things that it's just hard to relinquish sometimes. But once you can figure out who does what best, like I said, in that one thing, once you identify your, your superpower, then I think it's it's really cool. And then I was listening to something about the 1972 Miami Dolphins that said, it's amazing what you can accomplish when you don't care who receives the credit. So I, I really think about that in terms of working with people and understanding who does or doesn't get the credit. And, you know, Bill Paraki taught me a lot when I worked with him in terms of always surrounding yourself with people who are smarter than you. So clearly if that's an adage that you live by, then you can't walk in the room and think you're the smartest person. If that, then then you're not living up to the deal that you made with yourself. Well, let's talk about that for a second, because the, what I was going to ask you had to do with uh, accountability and having um, colleagues or, or people on your staff or people that aren't even part of your staff that watch and are around that help hold you accountable to what standard you've set, right. Or the truth tellers in your life. How, how does, how does, uh, Bill's comment that, you know, surround yourself with, with people smarter than you. How does that play out in what you've learned over 30 years of coaching um, in regards to when you've been at your best and, and having, you know, people to bounce things off of and, and that whole concept of, you know, if you're, if you're the smartest person in the room, you're in the wrong room. Yeah, for sure. I think, I, I think that in my time off, I actually learned that, there's just so many more resources available in the last two years. I've realized that, you know, if you look in the right place, you can find the right information. And if you call the right people, you can get the right information as well. So having a Rolodex full of numbers like you or really important or valuable numbers are things that are important to me. And I think that one of the things during my time off and then in my time spent as a department chair, it's really important to understand the value of leadership and just how important it is to study that and to make sure you are putting the pieces in place to utilize the, you know, everyone's strengths. So that's, 
that's where I get that information from in terms of working with a person like Bill, who, you know, was working with Dave Stivers at the, at that point in time, when, when we coach football together, it's just that group of individuals. And then his ability to call a professional coach, you know, I have this funny story. I ran into uh, Ron Rivera the other day at Costco. And I remember Bill set up um, a clinic and he invited all the local coaches. So mind you, coaches from Pacific Grove, Palma, the surrounding areas, Bill hosted an event at his house and Ron Rivera spoke and he spoke about leadership. He spoke about defensive game planning. And it was clear that, you know, he was, he was still invested in his community, did some really good things for us. And just to be able to talk football with someone who has coached a Super Bowl, uh, you know, Super Bowl team, although the Panthers didn't win. And then someone who actually played in the Super Bowl and someone who's from here and to see his reaction when he saw Dave Miller, who was his high school coach, that was, it was just a real, you know, that wasn't available for most people. And Bill made that happen because of his connections and, you know, his ability and desire to share. Yeah, no, that, that would be super cool to be able to get in a room like that. Um, so I have a combo question here, which I'll frame with, how has your approach to coaching changed over the time you've been doing this? But I also want you to wrap it up in the the concept and give us a little background on, I was away from coaching for this many years. This is what I learned during that time, which has shown up now as I approach being a coach and a leader. You mentioned the department chair piece, but like, what are some, like, how has your approach changed over the course of your career? But how important was it to actually step away? And, and not participate for a while. And now what does that look like coming back based on, on what you've learned and how you've shifted your perspective? Yeah, I think getting away from it was really important. I think I was so lucky that when I got involved in coaching that the first eight years of my career were spent in programs that were all about winning. So my philosophy was we had the best players, you know, guys were going to college on scholarships, you know, in my time spent at O'Dowd and at Jesuit, I was lucky enough to either coach or teach multiple major league baseball players, some kids who actually had division one scholarships in football, a professional tennis player, you name it. It was a sports factory. So a lot of things in terms of my coaching style were based on, developing kids to get to the next level, winning. And then all of a sudden I show back up here at Stevenson and I struggled the first few years because my philosophy and the school's mission weren't necessarily in perfect alignment. You know, I, 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 re I remember kids coming up to me the first few years I was here saying, hey, coach, I need to leave. I have a radio show and how upset I would get because of the, the lack of planning or understanding on my part. But then I recognized that I went to school here. I had a radio show. So taking a step away from that and, and letting kids know that when you come back that you need to get the full Stevenson experience. It's not just you show up, you play sports, and you don't have a show. You don't participate in a play. Uh, I just have a much better understanding of what's going on with respect to our kids who go to school here. I also just have a greater uh, respect for, you know, what everyone is doing in terms of looking at my colleagues in terms of what they do in coaching. I think I was very much siloed when I first got here and felt like the football coach was at odds with trying to get players from other programs like the water polo program. And now it's like, hey, how do I go to a water polo practice, see what they do, think about their team building exercise. I think about listening to your podcast with John Burke. And I think about, you know, Will Castrotano, who's a lacrosse coach and a soccer coach going to basketball practice. So those are the things that talking leadership, jumping on his podcast are things that I would have never done as a football coach back in, let's say 2008. I'm all, all about just football coaches and, and, and that sort of lifestyle and grinding and, you know, doing that thing. So stepping away was really good. And also looking at it through a parent lens, um, makes it a lot different. 
All right, well, you just opened up two avenues. I want to give you an opportunity to briefly uh, describe what you have learned as a multi-sport coach, as a multi-sport athlete. You brought up watching other teams do what they do. Can you name one or two things that you have directly stolen, appropriated, borrowed, whatever word you want to use, and uh, transferred it to one of your other endeavors? Oh, I think one of the things that I wouldn't necessarily say I borrowed it or stole it, working under Cooper and Cooper working with you, I really understand the value of getting the most you can in about 90 minutes to two hours. Like I understand that approach as a football coach, again, who run it till you run it right was the philosophy. And there would be points in time to where we practice two and a half, maybe two forty-five sometimes. So I know cutting back on time, uh, understanding nutrition, understanding hydration, uh, at a much better level now and understanding how we don't static stretch. We don't do the things that we used to do when I first started. Just evolving as a coach of athletics, I think learning from other people, I think I've taken a mix of like the time management skill, the nutrition skill, the other things that are translatable in terms of being an athlete. And then I just think that you know, some of the specific training that people are doing that is that overlaps with a lot of sports, especially sports played on grass with either a stick that has been really helpful in terms of uh, development for football players for certain. No doubt. And I want to go back to your other comment about now that I'm a parent, what have you been able to learn wearing your parent hat, watching your children be multi-sport athletes? Your daughter played three sports for the duration of her career. Um, you know, your your second child is is a dual sport athlete at this point, even though started at three and and Dee's playing three, and Gigi will probably play multiple things when she gets gets to high school. But what have you learned being a parent? watching the experiences they have had, hearing about the experiences they have had, that you now can apply as a coach, right? Because we talk about, oh, it, when does your perspective change when I had kids, right? So what is that like now as you're going through and you got three of them that, that have at least been at the high school level? I think when you are a coach, you understand the the importance of relationships, um, amongst your players, but it really doesn't hit home until you actually had kids who eat, sleep and drink the sport, but eat, sleep and drink the bus ride and the friendships and the camaraderie. And so I look at the friendships that I built as a player here in my relationships with my teammates. I could never see, I don't see that through the coach's lens, but I see it when I look at my kids and I, I see how, those relationships are so important to them. But I also see the fact that they want to do well. They want to excel and they want to make those around them proud. And I think that's that's the one thing that I've seen. So one of the things that I have to remember is there are points in time to where the line can be blurred between me being dad and me being coach. And Oftentimes I make the mo the waters a little murky because I try to do both at the same time. So I can't, I have to be very careful in terms of my supportive speech, even though I want to pump them up. Oftentimes they just need me to listen. And that's hard sometimes because I think when you're a teacher, or you're a coach, you often feel like you're a fixer. And when you're just listening, you're not fixing anything in your mind, but in essence, you really are helping them help guide your students, your kids, and anybody else through something that they may need help with. Yeah, it's, it's a dilemma, right? Because in certain sports that they're playing that you have experience in, you have different emotions and feelings attached, I would imagine, than ones that maybe you're not as well-versed in, right? So how do you navigate that 
as a colleague, as a coach, while still being a parent when dealing with your kids, right? And Brian Katz, who was a longtime coach at Sac State, told me, you know, he purposefully would go to games and sit in the deep corner, you know, where I sit at games. And, you know, people would come over and make comments about how they, what the hell is the coach doing? They don't know. And he would just say, hey, I think Germano Denise is the best coach in, in the United States. And ultimately, you know, shutting down that conversation, even if he didn't necessarily feel that, right? But it's kind of this, this gray space of, of how do you show up for your kid and at the same time teach them the lesson that you want them to have as somebody that's worn the coaching hat. Yeah, I think for me, it's it's I'm there and and I want them to know that that I am there to support them, but I'm not there to be a sideshow. I don't particularly talk to them on occasion. I think early on in my career as a dad, uh, one of my kids was pitching one day and and as a former baseball coach, I knew exactly what was going on and I whistled and I got the attention and I, I got an earful and at that point in time, I knew that it was one of those things to where like your kids are so trained to your voice sometimes that I don't try to say anything, even encouraging, sometimes not encouraging, just because I want them to focus on their own coach or their own things. So I try to stay out of the way as much as possible. But, I, you know, sometimes, like I said, when they come home or I'll say something like, hey, you know, this happened, what do you think? Or watching video but and and i'll say something that might be a little bit off color not not off color but just off the mark for them and you know they don't understand what i'm trying to say but i know what i'm trying to get to and it's more so like hey you did a good job and sometimes you have to just kind of smile and say yeah but you could have done this and you have to you have to restrain yourself from from you know coaching that extra thing and and maybe you pull one of your coaches aside and say, hey, why don't you tell them instead of having me do it? Absolutely. Uh, right. Tough being a parent sometimes, but we, we all do the best we can. All right. Uh, pivoting. This is uh, stolen from Tim Ferriss, and he, he will ask people on his podcast if they have a favorite failure that they have leaned on throughout their their life or their coaching journey. Is there something that that comes to front of mind where it was a pivotal moment for you to um improve or grow or, or has kept you in uh what what it is we do oh wow there have been there there have been many I, I think that you know I really try not to let my emotions get the best of me specifically with respect to officiating I know you and I have had some good conversations about controlling the things that you can control. And there were some moments early on in my coaching career to where I let the officiating impact how I coached my kids and I, even how I coached the game. So I think there, there are some moments in time back in the day when I would question some officials or do things that really took away from the game itself. And I think that was one of the things that I, I really had to learn to get over as I became a more experienced coach. I think that's the one that that sticks out mostly right now is like I really like this year was great. We had a successful year and I, I thought my interactions with the officials were far better than they had been in, in prior years for sure. Hold on one second. Here's one of my favorite questions. And this doesn't have to be sports related. You've got a lot of balls in the air so you can answer this from whatever lens you feel is most appropriate for you, but it's kind of a growth mindset question. What have you most recently changed your mind on? I used to be here. Now I'm over here and here's why. You know, when I was sitting on a zoom call with you a few weeks ago, we're thinking about just accountability. And I think one of the things that, I think I, I am or have changed my mind in terms of accountability and that's personal accountability more than anything else. I've always been able to manage my workflow, my coaching, my teaching, all the rest of the stuff. But one of the things that I haven't worked on personally was actually being 
and holding my own self accountable for doing things that were going to be best for me and for my family. So I would definitely say that, you know, one of the things that I've learned over time is the only thing preventing me from being my best self is me. And those are things that I didn't realize early on in my teaching career, my coaching career, and professionally, because there was a variety of excuses or reasons that prevented me from doing the things that I needed to do or wanted to do. So I think from a personal perspective, as someone who is continuing to try to grow as a leader more than anything else, because the leadership piece will take care of the classroom stuff with the students, it'll take care of the coaching stuff. But most, first and foremost, like leading my family and doing the things that I need to do, that I have to be the one who is accountable to myself and look myself in the mirror when I do something to, you know, let a student down. Like if I forget a meeting or something like that, hey, I have to be the one who has to show up and say, I'm sorry, I'm accountable for it. And again, there's no reason, there's no excuse. It's just really doing a better job of trying to hold myself to a standard and accountability that's a little bit better personally. Love that. And uh, because we're on that note, you mentioned earlier, our conversations over the years about officials and and uh, my usual approach, which is pretty hands off. Last night, I, I had a tough time and uh, TB had me before the game. He's like, yo, you got to let this stuff go. It was like we hadn't even started yet. And I was like, you know, the, the, the score table to this, to that. And it was like four minutes in, I'm like blowing my top because and not even because of missed calls or whatever, but like ways in which the the game wasn't being controlled from an aggression standpoint, where for the first time in a long time, like I felt like the kids were at risk. And um, the way in which I resolved it, finally, at the end of the first quarter, instead of worrying about the officials, is I just walked down to the other bench and I was like, yo, man, look, this is what happened. We have we got to get this under control because this is about them. And ultimately, if the refs aren't going to control it, then we need to. And uh, thankfully, the guy on the other end of the bench is a friend of mine and we have respect for one another. But it was like so much more beneficial to do that than to like spend five minutes trying to get the officials to worry about that referee the game, get the clock right. You know, it was just like, hey, you know what? We'll take you out of it. Let me go down here and talk to the coach. But it took me. 15 minutes to get my head straight so that I could get to that point. Um, and so I think that accountability piece is, is, is really important. Um, I want to share some of the things that we often talk about um, just in general. And one of the conversations we were having at lunch the other day was about how you can hack a sport for lack of a better word uh play a particular style that eliminates a lot of the additional time that you need to spend right so you and i have joked about like look and i'm not big on scouting because like if we have to if they're doing what they want we're not doing a good job of pressing and trapping and taking them out of what they want and i asked you what the football equivalent is or right the baseball equivalent or things you've seen in other sports that you can offer as as ways that you could steal time back as an adult for your kids and still have the same outcomes and results um, by being more efficient. Yep. No, I thought about what you said uh, about that just the other day. And I was thinking one of the things that's important in football is to have a core group of, or set of plays that you can run but I think the very effective and good coaches will get the most out of running the same play and making it look different. So all the window dressing that you can do is really important in the sense that your kids are all running the same play. So if you run a concept, concept like stick in football, you are working with a certain collection of routes and those routes can be run out of a three by one set that's either tight, bunched, you can use motion. So inevitably your kids are running the same plays over and over again, but your opponent is thinking that they're different, a different set of plays. So doing that in terms of hacking it is really figuring out what 
core group of plays that your team runs best and finding the most creative ways of running them. And football also understanding how you can minimize the special team game in certain respects that I've spoken to coaches who say, look, we don't cover kickoffs very well. So we squib or kick out of bounds. So we don't have to cover them. So we don't have to spend a ton of time in practice doing that. So the flip side of that is we ran a bunch of swinging gate plays on offense this year. And again, those are things that sometimes that when you show something funny like that, coaches have to spend an inordinate amount of time working on it. So you can use that to your advantage as well. We thought it gave us an advantage. I never looked at it from like, hey, so-and-so is going to see this on film and have to spend an extra 20 minutes trying to defend these two plays. But in essence, it, it works that way. And you find out what your kids do best and you just you go from there. Well, it's funny that you mentioned that because – I remember us having conversations during the year that was like, we're going to run this from the middle of the field. And I kept waiting for it, kept waiting for it. It never happened. But it, it what, the way in which you framed it um, was very much what we were talking about, which is how do you still practice time for yourselves, but from other people, right? And it's like, ultimately, if they have to spend all their time preparing for you, then you don't have to spend as much time worrying about them and you can just focus on yourself. And I think that's something that like every coach has to be true to their identity and, and lean into that and in whatever way that is for them. And we evolve over time, but it's, I, I think there's an authenticity to, this is what I believe in and we're going to die on this hill. And when that's not what you believe anymore, either you pivot or it's, it's time to move on. And I think yeah. that, uh, the way you frame that's really good. It's like, how, how do you still practice time from other people, even though that wasn't your intention, but it, it, it truly adds to that mix. Um, and, and I really like that. All right. Uh, wrap up thoughts. Um, if you could give a pitch as a parent more than anything, you've had, you got four kids, three of them have played high school athletics. Um, what are the things that are most important to you as a parent in the lives of your children that they receive from their coaches, right? Like you could craft it. Like these are the things I care about. All this other stuff is just noise. I think they need to know that the coaches care. And so we all have our own way of showing it. But I think if you are – authentic and who you are and it's genuine that you do care that kids appreciate it i think they also need to be seen which is huge and I, I think they also need to understand that coaches need to understand that a small comment can go a long way sometimes so be extremely careful with sarcastic comments or anything of the sort simply because you never know if a kid's having a bad day you never know how that comment resonates with them. So I would say, hey, they need to know that you care. They need to know that they feel seen and appreciated. And then they also need to know that you, and when I say care, they need to make sure that the coaches care about them, not care about winning, losing, competing, and care about their job. So I, I, I have said at points in my time that, you know, I care about this more than you and kids don't necessarily need to hear that they need to understand that you are doing your job your job as a coach is to care about that and 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 doing the things that keep them safe but they really need to make sure that you know the coaches can can see them and they build the camaraderie and do the things that are really important for the kids to have a good time while also developing playing and having you know the most fun that they can have yeah, and I'll just wrap up on that because I think the way you frame that, things that you say, you got three kids, or you have four kids again, but three in the house that have been through the high school that receive feedback very differently. Mm -hmm. And one coach could talk to them, like, no joke, like, replay the video, and they're all going to receive it differently. Same like in my household, right, where, you know, one's going to come back and try to fight you and prove you wrong, and one's just going to be like, you know what, you're dead to me. Right. So it's like, how do you how do you learn your kids from the stake, not your children, but your your athletes 
from the sake of like, this is how this kid receives information. <laughs> how can I meet them where they are versus everybody's got to be in lockstep in this like reprodu- reproducible, like storm to- trooper type <laughs> uh, human beings. That's for sure. I mean, I, I just remember somebody asked Jimmy Johnson a question about consistency and he was like, I am very consistent. I treat everyone differently. And so I, I thought about that at one point in time. It was like, I can't treat, you know, a second string defensive back the same way I treat my starting running back in terms of accountability. They're just different and they're different people. So you have to understand what value people bring to the team. And I think if they're seen, they're heard, and you appreciate and understand it, then everybody has a role. And I think that that's, that's really important. And working with this group of freshman football players this year, I saw that there are kids who were vital and important to the team, even though they didn't play a ton. Every kid brings something to the table that's important, and it's our job to try to appreciate and understand it and really get the most of them, most out of them. And, you know, still working with that. I mean, you know, by by no means do I feel like I'm an expert, but it really gives me a little bit more understanding to really go out of my way to make sure kids are being taken care of. No, absolutely. I think that's a great way to, to frame that. Um, <laughs> I treat everybody differently. Yeah, I'm consistent. I'm consistent. <laughs> Love it. All right. Well, I'm going to let you get back to the rest of your life. Thanks for being on. Appreciate you. Probably well, see you good. in the next couple hours. <laughs> I appreciate it. You made me think of some really important things that I need to make sure I get rolling on for my own personal and professional growth. So I appreciate the time you spent and the questions you asked. All right.